This video was brought to you by Blinkist, the fast and convenient book summarizing app. Hello friends, my name is JJ, and a while ago I came across this meme that somebody posted on Instagram. Vote blue removes stubborn orange stains. I thought that this was kind of an interesting graphic because of the way it could conceivably mean so many different things in so many different parts of the world. In America, where I assume this was made, the translation would basically be vote Democrat to get rid of the Republicans, because blue is the color associated with the Democratic Party in American culture, while orange became the color most associated with President Trump's administration because of his uh, distinctive complexion. Here in Canada, however, the message would be completely opposite. Instead of vote left to kick out the right, over here this graphic would mean vote right to kick out the left, because in Canada orange is considered a left-wing color and blue is the color of conservatives. In Portugal, however, it would mean something closer to vote far right to kick out the center right, while in Northern Ireland it would be something like vote Tory to kick out the Protestants, or something equally weird. So today, let us have a little chat about why it is that so many different countries wound up with such vastly different theories about the political opinions of colors. So I would say that we here in the Western world do not have as deep or sophisticated theories about the cultural significance of colors as they often do in the East. Like, I was recently reading that when the French video game Rayman was brought to Japan, they had to recolor the main character blue, simply because purple is considered such a sinister color in Japanese culture. It was thought that a game with a purple hero might not be marketable. You likewise probably already know that in the Middle East, green is considered the color of Israel. Islam. In India, orange is the color of Hindus. And in China, red is the color of good times. In contrast, what sort of comparable color traditions do we have in the West? Black is our color associated with death and mourning. And it's the color that artists wear at gallery openings, so you know who to suck up to. And white is a color associated with purity and goodness, which has some unfortunate racial implications, but it's also the color of surrender. I've heard it said that the flag of Florida was switched from this to this because of how much Americans associate white flags with weakness. And I know we're all taught that purple is the royal color, although I don't know if we actually see that much proof of that these days. I guess Crown Royale whiskey comes in a purple bag, but I've also heard over the years that red and blue are also supposed to be royal colors, and that this is why we call the darker shade of blue royal blue, and why the British House of Lords is done up in red. But this sort of inconsistency just proves my point. Clearly a lot of our color cliches have a pretty weak cultural grounding, which is why I think we Westerners have always been a bit fascinated by the topic of political colors, which seem to hint at the possibility of a deeper cultural heritage of color symbolism. But unfortunately, after doing a bit of research on this topic, I must say that the results are not actually that satisfying. The tradition of political colors in Western countries is by and large an extremely new thing, and if it ever seems to line up in any sort of consistent way across nations, it is often just a giant coincidence. The one big exception is the color red. Most color historians, or Calorians seem to agree that red became politicized around the time of the Third French Revolution, which was the one in the mid-19th century, rather than the more famous one in the 1790s. The people rebelling against the French government of that time started waving a lot of red flags, often with slogans written on them, and it sort of became a symbol of that whole scene. There doesn't seem to be much hard evidence that anyone put much thought into why red specifically, other than it was a striking color and maybe somewhat associated with French patriotism given it was one of the colors on the French flag. But anyone who goes around saying that it was chosen because it represents the blood of the struggling masses or whatever is just romanticizing and speculating about something that seems to have arisen fairly organically and thoughtlessly. Now, the mid-19th century is known for being a time of other revolutions in Europe as well, often driven by the demands of the growing middle class, such as parliamentary democracy and labor rights. And inspired by the French, red is said to have caught on 
as the fashionable branding color for all sorts of revolutionary or radical type ideas during this period, a legacy that still survives to some degree to this day. Many European social democratic parties that grew out of the organized labor movement of the mid 19th century, like the British Labor Party, the German Social Democratic Party, or the Spanish Socialist Workers Party, I'll use red for this reason. But so does the Canadian Liberal Party, which has nothing to do with organized labor, but instead traces its origins to Canada's so-called Party Rouge movement of the mid-19th century. This was a movement mostly led by middle-class French Canadians who wanted their colonial society to embrace a more democratic form of government, which, like I said, was also a big cause of many of the red flag agitators in Europe at the time. This sort of broad theme of red as the color of political agitation is similarly the only reason why we associate red with communism, why we talk about the Red Scare or the Red Menace. The communist government that was set up in the Soviet Union was a product of a revolution in the early 20th century, a time at which red had become the generic European revolutionary color. In fact, the oft-forgotten Russian Revolution of 1917 that predated the communist revolution used red as their color as well. Now, America's revolution occurred long before the European revolutions, which is probably why the color red never became as politicized in America as it did elsewhere. That's changed recently, of course, and we now associate red with the Republican Party in the form of red MAGA hats or the reference to conservative parts of America as being red states in contrast to the Democrats' blue states. There's a lot of urban legends about how this came to be, and to help explain, I have my pal Grant, the casual historian on the line, who recently did a good video on this topic. All right, so Grant, the story that I have traditionally been told uh, about why the Republicans are the red states and the Democrats are the blue states is because supposedly in the old days when the American television news stations would put their big color-coded maps of the election up on the TV, they used to rotate between red and blue for the Democrats and the Republicans. Like, it would switch back and forth. Sometimes Democrats would be red, sometimes Democrats would be blue. But then in 2000, uh, that was sort of the big traumatizing election for a lot of people. Uh, you know, everybody was sort of watching the coverage night after night. And as a result, that particular election just happened to occur at a time in which the Republicans were uh, given the red color and the Democrats were given the blue color. And then for that reason, that sort of became forevermore the kind of permanent meme of what color goes with what party. Uh, do I have that right or wrong? Uh, well, that's the story that most people will hear. And when you look it up, that's what most of the articles will say. But when you look at the actual like election night coverage archival footage, you find that that's not really the case, or at least it's not as simple as that. Like the first election broadcast to actually be done in color, which would allow for a color electoral map was in 1968. And even then they didn't do an electoral college map. We wouldn't see an electoral college map color coded in any way until 1976 when NBC decided to add it. And of course the other two big uh, television networks, ABC and CBS, all thought that map was, you know, a, a gaudy little gimmick that wouldn't catch on. Of course, by 1980, every network was using it. In that first election, NBC decided in 1976 to use the British color scheme for their coverage. So they had the Republicans in blue with Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter with the Democrats colored in red. However, when 1980 came along and then ABC and CBS had their own maps, they decided to use the reverse color scheme. Exactly why is disputed. Uh, they would basically keep their red for Republicans and blue for Democrats as a color scheme until the present day. CNN, of course, came on to the uh, television in, in the 1980s. And so when they started, they copied the NBC color scheme of blue for Republicans and red for Democrats, but by 1992, they switched to the ABC and CBS scheme. And then by 1996, NBC had switched over as well. Prior to the 2000 election, most of the cable news networks were covering election night with Republicans for red and Democrats for blue. Basically what you're saying is that for a long time this was something that was dictated more by the networks rather than any sort of larger sort of theme or, or consistent principle in terms of what color was used for what party. Yeah, that was more or less the case. There are, when you look at the article, some of them will give some kind of inkling that like, oh, ABC and CBS wanted to help the Democrats win, and so they switched the color schemes so that way the Democrats wouldn't be associated with communism themselves. But I think it has more to do simply with wanting to be different than NBC, because, you know, they first criticized NBC for their big map 
and then they copied it the next year, so they want it to be different in some way. All right, thank you for that, Grant. Be sure to check out Grant's full video on the history of red states and blue states for more information on this topic. An interesting byproduct of all of this is that purple is now America's go-to color to represent political centrism and moderation since it's a mix of red and blue. When Hillary Clinton lost the 2016 presidential election to Donald Trump, both she and her husband wore purple at her concession speech the next day, in what was obviously supposed to symbolize the idea that they were being gracious losers and wanting to encourage Americans of both parties to come together. My never-Trumper pal Tim Miller similarly wrote a column the other day promoting the idea of red dog Democrats, which is his clever new term for former Republicans who have started to vote Democrat. This piggybacks on an older expression of blue dog Democrats, who were conservative Democrats that often aligned with Republicans. Though in that case, calling them blue was just a random thing. There was a conservative faction of Democrats in Congress who just used to meet in a room with a picture of a blue dog on the wall. And this was back in the day before our modern understanding of the party colors was established. Talking of blue, Americans often believe that blue is the conservative color everywhere else, but this is only partially true. It's certainly true in Britain these days, but that's also a relatively new thing. In the days before the Labour Party became Britain's second major party, different parts of England used wildly different colors to brand their parties at different times, as we can hear in this explainer I found in this 1873 British magazine. At Norwich, blue and white are the Whig colors, and orange and purple the Tory. But curiously enough, the colors for the county of Norfolk are not only not the same, but very greatly. At one election, the Whigs were distinguished by orange and blue, at another by orange and white, the Tories being pink and purple. At an election for one seat only, the Whigs bore green and the Tories purple colours. At Preston, dark blue was the Tory colour, and the Whigs bore orange, the independent Liberal being green. When Hunt was a candidate, he adopted red, but now the regular Liberal colour is green, and lately the chairman of a large political meeting called on the thousands present to rally around the green flag of Liberalism, the colour which meant vitality. Following the rise of the Labour Party, which had consistent red branding due to its association with the radical tradition we mentioned earlier, the thinking is that the Conservatives began to use blue more consistently just because it created a good contrast. But it wasn't the party's official colour until 1949, and according to this article in the New Statesman, Nationwide party colors have only been around since the 1980s. As in America, this is often credited to the rise of color television and the need for journalists to make color-coded maps and graphics that could be understood by the entire country. It seems to be a coincidence that the Canadian Conservative Party uses blue as well. And in fact, using blue for conservatives in Canada probably predates using blue for conservatives in England. As we mentioned, the more progressive pro-democracy faction in 19 century Canada was known as Le Parti Rouge, while the more regressive anti-democratic faction was Le Parti Bleu. In those days, conservative French Canadians were all super Catholic, and blue was considered a holy Catholic color associated with the Virgin Mary and heaven. There's a very famous political slogan you always learn when you're studying this period of Canadian history. The conservative French Canadians used to always go around saying, heaven is blue, hell is red. In modern day Canada, we also have our own version of the whole red dog, blue dog thing. A moderate conservative is often called a red Tory. <coughs> Meanwhile, the fact that the moderate left in Canada has long been associated with the color red meant that our nominally socialist party, the NDP, had to go with a different color once it was created much later. When you look at old Canadian election maps, like this official government one from 1972, you can see that originally green was the NDP color, while pink was used for the populist right-wing Social Credit Party. But by the late 1970s, the NDP started using orange and Social Credit green. Luckily, Social Credit died out before the Canadian Green Party came along, or that would have gotten confusing. As far as I can tell, there was no deep reason why the NDP started using orange, other than it contrasted well with the red and blue of the other two parties. This seems to be the same reason why Britain's third place party, the Liberal Democrats, also made the switch from green to orange in the 1970s. You'd never see a switch like that happen in Northern Ireland, however, where orange is considered the color of the Protestant parties 
Orange and green, the color of the Catholic ones. This traces back to William of Orange, the Dutch-born British king associated with ending Catholic rule of Britain in the 17th century. In Portugal, meanwhile, orange is the color of their conservative party. Although I think that might have something to do with the fact that, from what I understand, in Portugal, every political party is officially considered left-wing because democracy in Portugal arose in the context of opposition to a right-wing dictatorship. Most other center-right parties in Europe use blue as their color, however. This is presumably copied from Britain just in the narrow sense that most European countries also have a socialist red party as their other big one. So the blue-red contrast is aesthetically pleasing both on TV maps and in election posters and websites and whatnot. It's worth noting that a lot of European center-right parties don't even call themselves conservative, but rather liberal, and often grew out of completely different political traditions than what produced British Toryism. Over in Germany, meanwhile, their main center-right party is black which can cause some fun. See, the Germans tend to elect a lot of parties to their parliament, which means that forming coalitions is a big part of getting anything done. And every time there's an election, the German press will inevitably wheel out all of these clever color metaphors to describe the possible coalitions that might define the future. Like, will it be a traffic light coalition or a Jamaica coalition or a tiger duck coalition? Tiger ducks, I am told, being a popular children's toy in that country. Alrighty, so if you have made it this far, chances are you are a person with an insatiable appetite for knowledge, no matter how obscure the topic. So why not give today's video sponsor Blinkist a try? Blinkist is a very cool app that summarizes popular nonfiction books, both in written summaries and podcast style ones that you can listen to on your phone. You know as well as I do that there are just an impossibly gigantic number of books out there these days. So this is one highly efficient way you can quickly absorb the gist of hundreds of pages of information in about 15 minutes or less. For instance, as part of my research for this video, I listened to a quick Blinkist summary of the 2003 book Color by Victoria Finlay, which is all about the history of man's often fanatic obsession with finding new and ever more beautiful colors, even when that meant dyeing your clothes with the slime of sea snails or painting your walls with poison. But it's not just colorology. Blinkist has summaries of over 4,000 books to choose from on countless different topics, from environmentalism to business to science to geopolitics to self-improvement, including many red-hot new releases. If you've got a bottomless hunger for facts, why not give Blinkist a free trial using the link in the thing below? The Blinkist people have been a very loyal sponsor of this channel over the last few months, so be sure to give them a look if you haven't already, and discover how to fit more learning into your life. All right, so speaking of learning, as usual, I'm keen to hear if you guys have any more interesting insights about the politics of color you wanna share with the rest of the class. Not only what colors are associated with what political parties or movements are in the world, but any color-related slogans or catchphrases that might be popular where you live as well. Let me know in the comments and I will see you next week.